Um, good afternoon, everybody. This is um, P.L. Malcolm with another Legacy Project uh, interview. I'm here uh, with legendary and master teacher Bill Robinson, and I'm at his home with Nemory Robinson, and today is January 10th, 2015. Uh, Mr. Robinson, you've had many, many different careers. Um, you know, uh, forgive me for saying, you know, but being 95 years old, you've done <laughs> lots of things. And so I applaud you and, and I look forward to hearing uh, lots of your stories. But um, one of those stories that you had was as a band director. So my first question is, what was your uh, decision to become a band director? And what were maybe some of those circumstances that led you in that band journey? This is an interesting question. Because all the time I was in school, I had no desire to become a teacher. I didn't, that seemed very natural to me. I mean, it didn't uh, seem strange. And in my last semester at the University of Oklahoma, I didn't know what I was going to do when I graduated, but I knew I wasn't going to teach because I didn't have any particular desire to do that. So the band director from Norman High School got a better job in Oklahoma City at a junior high, better paying job, because Norman didn't have much money. They had two institutions there, the University of Oklahoma and the State Mental Health Hospital, <laughs> neither of which brought any tax money in. So it was one of the lower paying jobs in the state. So Jimmy Walker, who was a good friend of mine, got a job in Oklahoma City at a junior high, and he took it. He needed to take it right then, and this was about oh, midway in the last semester of my senior year. So they asked me if I would go down two periods a day and take the band. And I jumped at the opportunity because they would pay me a handsome salary of $40 a month. And in those days, that was a lot of money for a college student that didn't have any. So I took the job and went down two periods a day. Well, I'd never worked with kids that much, but I found out I enjoyed working with them. They were very good kids and they wanted to learn and we had a great time. And I took the band and uh, they were getting ready for contest. And we went to contests, and they did all right, I guess. And uh, uh, then by the end of the school year, uh, well, about a month left, I guess, I guess the, they must have liked my work because they raised my salary from $40 a month to $50 a month, <laughs> which was terrific, you know. Seems like a lot of money mm -hmm. if you don't have any. So... I was excited about that, so then they gave me a contract for next year at the schools, I think it was $1,900 a year, something like that. Well, that's fine, and I started the school year, and, and uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, Nemory and I had gotten married. And then we were living in Norman, and uh, that was, uh, I thought, a pretty good contract. You know, it wasn't really much money, but there was a lot more than I had. So uh, we started out the new year. Well, in November, I went to the Army. I was drafted, which I didn't regret, and I spent 38 wonderful months in the Army. I say wonderful because I met some really great people. Great experience. I was lucky. Had a good experience. Oh, no, come on in, Nemory. Let me introduce you. And to our audience, this is um, Nemory Robinson, uh, Mr. Bill's lovely wife. And uh, she may come in here and uh, give him some reminders. So do you have a reminder for Bill? Oh, I was just going to tell him, don't forget about... Um from uh, was Germany. It? Germany. He went into, we took us up to Ziesel um, in the mountains and uh, showed us around and 
gave us a in, nice treat at the hotel. In Austria. Yeah, in Austria. It was yeah. really something. Wow. And he was a wonderful player. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're going to get to Bill's uh, playing career, but, but Mr. Robinson um, has a pretty extraordinary career path, yes, you know, being you know, being in the military, mm -hmm. uh, playing in the Army band for 38 months, as you're saying, and then yeah. as a high school band director, I think, for 20 years, mm -hmm. and then also college for uh, professor, and, and then professional, so... When I when I get to um, your professional career, can can we talk about some of the oh, people? Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Well, good. All right. Thank you. It's yeah. nice seeing you, Miss Robinson. Thank you. And where was I? So you were talking about how many wonderful people you met in the army, yeah. uh, playing in the army band. And I learned so much from them. There, there were a few really fine, fine musicians, and uh, it was a great experience. And. Uh, I never will forget, I said something, we had a bassoon player who was a Curtis graduate, played in the Pittsburgh Symphony under the Reiner and other orchestras, wonderful player, very good friend, and uh, I said something at one rehearsal, something to do with a whole note not to let it just sit still. And he looked at me and said, where'd you learn that? I said, I thought a minute and said, well, I learned it from a choral conductor <laughs> uh, who would never let us let a phrase sit still. Mm -hmm. And, you know, things like that were very interesting because this was a world, this fellow had played under Stokowski mm -hmm. and Reiner and a wonderful player. Mm -hmm. And here I was from Oklahoma. I said something that kind of shocked him because he didn't know anybody from Oklahoma would know things like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you, you started at um, Norman High School and then you get drafted? Were you yes, drafted, I was drafted in the Army? And then where, where did you go in well, the Army? When I was drafted, Luckily, they sent me to a band stationed in El Paso, and that's where I met Nimri, which was one of the finest things that ever happened to me. And I stayed in that band for the duration, and actually there were two bands joined together and made a bigger band. We had a better ensemble. And... Uh, then one of the bands was sent overseas the last six months of the war. And I was in that band and we went to the Philippines, to the Manila's Leave Center where the people from the front came back. The veterans that had been through horrible things were sent back to the Manila Leave Center. We felt like imposters sitting there enjoying all the mm -hmm. Uh, benefits of the uh, Manila Leaf Center and uh, it was really established for the people that had been to the front. Yeah. So we were there six months then the war was ended and they sent us home. Yeah. But you know you, you, you say that maybe you felt a little guilty because you got to enjoy that but that you were part of their convalescing. You know you were part of their well, that's true, and Lifting believe it or experience. not, the most important work we did, we had two dance bands in our, in our band. The band didn't do much of anything. The dance bands did a lot of work, yeah. which was very important. It was a morale booster for the troops, mm -hmm. and uh, our band was fronted by Ralph Young, who had been with Les Brown, and some other big names. Mm. And well, he couldn't read a note of music. Didn't make any difference. He had talent. Mm -hmm. He could sing. And and one other interesting thing, in the Army Band, you actually didn't play French horn. Well, no, I was a trombone. Originally, I was a baritone player in school. Took up trombone in the Army, got a hold of a trombone, and learned to play it. And I played it in the dance band. I see. And Leonard Hale, who was a horn player in the band, was a former student of Max Potag. 
And he was an up-and-coming professional kid just out of high school. So I got to know him very well, and he helped me get started on horn. And that's how I got going on horn. I yeah. wanted to play the horn. And uh, so I played, we played all these Les Brown specials, and Ralph Young, our director, would uh, would have music sent to us, special arrangements, you know. Yeah. They'd have horn spots where you pick up the horn and play two notes, uh -huh. that sort of thing. So I did that with the dance band. Well, Mr. Robinson, um, we've got a lot of uh, ground to cover, so... Um, after you served 38 months in the Army Band, you, I guess, went back to, did you go back to Norman? I went back to Norman. They had hired a man to teach there, and he, he was supposed to teach the whole year. And I went back after the second semester started. I wasn't about to go in and say, give me my job back, and he'd be out of a job. So I did my work on a master's at OU uh, till he finished out the year. And then I started the next year back in Norman. Do you remember what they paid you then? Did you get paid? Well, they paid me then the handsome sum. I think it was 9000 a year, maybe. Oh, okay. So that Something was like that. really substantial then. Well, big time. <laughs> yeah, it felt like big time to me. Oh, so you were at Norman, um, and I guess you taught maybe 14 years or so? Or? I was there, <clears throat> uh, I think it was 14 years. We left in 58. Okay. Or 59. Maybe it's 59. But I, th I think I was there 14 years. And the interesting thing was, after our last concert of the high school band, the superintendent of schools came up to my office and visited with me for about an hour, and he could not understand why I wanted to leave. Everything was going so great. And uh, I said, well, I can't explain it. I just know it's time for me to go on and do something else. Mm -hmm. And I had a chance to go to El Paso and play in the symphony there and teach in the middle school. And the main thing was I wanted to play. And he couldn't understand that. He was a very nice man and they treated me great. And uh, I, I hated to leave, but I felt it was a good time because everything was in good shape. Yeah. And we didn't have a good program. Everybody thought we had a great program. We didn't. We started them in the seventh grade. But I had seven teachers from the Oklahoma City Symphony that came in every week and taught privately. And that's why we had such great players. Yeah. That and the fact we had good students. Yeah. Not that we had a good program. But, you know, it wasn't a bad program, but it wasn't as good as it would have been if we'd started in the sixth grade, which we couldn't do at the time. Well, um, let me ask you this question. As, um, as a band director, what were some of the challenges you encountered? Oh, I can't think of any great challenges other than the fact we didn't have much money. That's always a challenge, but that was pretty typical of most band situations. They never had enough money. Uh, I don't remember any particular challenge. The administration was always great to work with, and the band made good progress. We had good private teachers coming in every week, no problem with that. And mainly the kids were just great to work with. So I don't remember anything that was uh, a real problem or a real hard challenge. Uh, of course, we did try for several years to hire an assistant, and finally they got enough money together to hire an assistant. That was a big step forward. Mm -hmm. Before that, I was the only teacher in the whole system. We had nothing in the grade schools. We started them in junior high, 
And then we got an assistant. So I was his assistant in junior high. He was my assistant in high school. The fact was, we just worked together all the time. And so it, it made for a very good program. I learned a lot from him. Well, in your career, did you feel that there were any pivotal moments that maybe brought um, you and your students to their musical success? You, you talked about private lessons and then bringing in an assistant the, and director. I would say one of the biggest things, and it seems very insignificant when you think about it, but when we had this assistant, he taught me how to count. Why? Well, know about the foot pat and I counted one and two and like everybody else which is the most indefinite syllable you can use he said and I mentioned it to him one time he said well I'll show you how to count he was a very straightforward guy I'd ask him something he'd tell me he said you count just like this one tita that's four to a beat one tita two tita three tita four tita everything requires an an articulation and that's simple and it's simple rhythm and that ties in with the foot pad down up down up down up down up then the other thing was totally different rhythmic feeling was uh, compound rhythm three to beat one lolly two lolly down hold up down hold up that sounds very simple and it's very easy. I'm surprised we didn't know that all those years. And after we knew how to teach the kids to count, they could read. And we suddenly realized the reason they didn't read well because of rhythm, not, not they couldn't play the notes, just rhythm. Then they could read. We had all this free time on our hands. We didn't have to teach by rote anymore. So, and I remember we took the junior high band to the state contest. Back in those days, it was called a contest. And my assistant had the junior high band, and before they, they were going into the sight reading. And I went in to listen to them. And before they started, he had a couple of minutes with them. He looked over. On this measure, let's count that measure. And they counted just like that, whatever it was. Well, the judge was the dean of the School of Music of North Texas. I've forgotten his name, but he's a well-known person. Afterwards, he was so amazed at how this junior high band could read and could count simple rhythm and compound rhythm. He was utterly amazed. How did they do it? So the upshot was they invited my assistant to the TMEA, Texas Music Educator Association, meeting to show this wonderful new idea of how you teach counting. Very, very simple. So that's how it got started. And I think you mentioned this in your book as well, don't you? I think so. We wrote a book and um, had that in it. Yeah, what is the name of that book? Uh, let me think a minute. Uh, can I look it up? Yeah. Uh, I haven't written that many books, so you wouldn't think I'd have trouble remembering the name of it. Use interpretation, that's not it. It's Tobias Mate. Music dictionary. I know I've got it here somewhere. Well, but anyway, yeah, I don't want it's, it to. Uh, uh, well, why don't I? Um, I'll get that information from you when we uh, yeah, when we get go off it. camera. And, sure. And then I can put this in our notes. That'll be fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, um, so that does sound like a pretty m magical moment when you discovered. How okay. to count. Yeah, teaching these kids how to count, and even for you as a teacher. That meant more to us than any other one thing I can ever remember. Okay, well that's good. Now, let me ask you this. Um, uh, that was, that's, a, that's a nugget. That's some great uh, information. What about other 
things that you learn, you know, anything, words or wisdom that you would like to share with younger band directors or would, future band directors I would or say teachers? The, the other big thing, probably almost equal to this, was how to use the air. Hmm. For years, I'd heard everything there was to say about how to breathe, how to use the air. Right. Raise the chest, don't raise the chest, expand the middle, don't expand the middle, do all these things. And then, in 1977, I went to Arnold Jacobs. I'd heard all these wonderful stories about how much people learned from him. And one of the students who'd been with him, I asked him, I said, what does he teach you? What, are, what do you learn? He said, I don't know, it just makes you play better than you can play. <laughs> I said, okay, that's great. I'm going to go find out what it is. So I went to him. And the first lesson I had with him, he said, well, what do you want from me? I said, I want to learn how to use the air. He said, well, you couldn't understand it if you didn't have a medical background anyway. I said, I don't care if I understand it, I just want to learn how to do it. He said, okay, this is all there is to it. Open the mouth, take a breath, and blow. <laughs> Which I did. And then he pitched me a pencil. And I caught it in my hand. And he said, no. I pitched you the pencil. What'd you do? I caught it. What did you think when you caught it? I thought a minute. Just catch the pencil. You didn't think which muscle you used, which hand you used, which arm you used. You just thought catch the pencil. That's the way you teach breath support. You don't teach all these foolish things that everybody recommends like expand around here, use this muscle, don't use that muscle, don't raise the shoulders, raise the shoulders, all those things that I'd heard all the years. Forget it. Just open the mouth, take a breath, and blow. Since that time in 1977, I've had no problem with any student I ever had about developing a good tone. Because all we do when we first start, blow an air column through the mouthpiece, then buzz the lips, then play that tone. Now take a breath and play that tone. Yeah, it's so simple. So we overthink it. I oh, know. Yeah, I know. One of the other things um, you talk about is yawn and sigh. Well, this was from Vince Chickowitz, who was the second trumpet in Chicago Symphony for how many years? Long time. And his big thing was breath support. All you do is a yawn and a sigh. Yawn and aside. To yawn, you open up yeah. inside the mouth. <sighs> Blow a, uh, an air column, but it's relaxed, it's not tight and tense. And I've used that technique ever since, and I have no trouble with getting students to have a good sound. They might not be able to play much, but they got a good sound. Hmm. I've got one more that. I know that you're great at teaching and helping. Um, what about embouchure placement for French horn? Embouchure placement, that's a very good one, because I struggled with that. When I took up the horn in the Army, uh, Leonard Hale was helping me, and he didn't say much about it, so I was a trombone player, baritone trombone, and I placed the mouthpiece half and half, pretty much, on the baritone or trombone, did the same thing on the horn. Well, when I went to George Yeager after the war, George was a wonderful horn player. Mm -hmm. And I talked the University of Oklahoma into hiring him as an adjunct professor of horn so I could take lessons with him <laughs> through the GI Bill. <laughs> Pretty sneaky. And get, he could get paid for it and, I, and get credit for teaching, and I could get credit for studying with him. But mainly, I wanted to study with him. Well, after the first lesson, I said, well, is everything okay? Do you see anything uh, out of order? And George was a very straightforward guy. He said, well, if you ever expect to play the horn, you have to change your armature, just like that. It was a blow out of the blue. And I had to move the mouthpiece up where it's mainly on the upper lip. And that's no big problem now was then for me because I had to change from getting used to being half and half, move it up. And uh, that's the only thing that I, I'd say about horn embouchures. 
get the mouthpiece mainly on the upper lip and not below the red part of the lower lip. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing. And you also talk about, um, you know, not, uh, help me out here, you talk about you bringing your face to the horn or your horn to your face. You know what I'm talking, when I'm... Uh, <coughs> I think I do. <coughs> when you bring your mouthpiece up to your face, um, I know there's something that you, you're you always talking about um, where, it, where it just falls naturally <coughs> on your face. Again, it's like this concept of breathing. You just put the mouthpiece on your face. Can, can you help me explain it a little better? Well, I think the main thing is... is uh, Go ahead. I don't remember having any particular problem with that, but most of the kids that come to me, whether 6th graders or 12th graders, very few times do I have to do anything with the embouchure. Very few. Because I think most people that start them get them started pretty well with the mouthpiece on the upper lip. <coughs> like that. Mainly on the upper lip, not down below the red part. Right. That's the main thing. Okay. And use the lip as little as possible. Use the air and the ear. Right. <coughs> and since I've been teaching that way, I used to think a lot about the embouchure. Uh, Phil Farkas says in his book, when you go higher, you make a smaller aperture. Well, you can take that two ways. You can take it the way he meant it, but I took it the wrong way. I thought too much about that, and I worried too much about making the smaller aperture. You don't do that. A smaller aperture happens. You don't make it. It happens because you're singing the pitch in your head as you play it. You think the pitch, and the brain will tell the lip what to do to produce that pitch. I learned that from Arnold Jacobs. And you never have any problem. Hmm. Well, um, obviously, there's so many of these subjects we could talk on for days, you know, your career in the, the military and in high school and teaching and, and now you're you're telling me so many wonderful um, thoughts about teaching and, and your pedagogy. But um, what, since we just have a few more minutes left, um, what concepts do you feel that you would like, that you've instilled in your students to have them achieve a, a higher quality of music? I think the main thing, and this it took me several years to learn, because I was a slow learner, I guess, <laughs> but the main thing, sing the pitch in your head, inhale, exhale, and the hardest part of that is inhaling. That's what kids don't want to do, so every lesson I have with every student, whether sixth grade or grad student, First thing we do is take the mouthpiece, turn it around backwards, and blow an air column. You're not thinking about embouchure. You're all you're thinking about is inhale, exhale. Then you turn it around and buzz the lips the same way. If you're not careful, the kid won't blow the same way when he buzzes as when he doesn't. So you get him to do the same thing. Right away it gets a good sound. The embouchure is fine. You place it uh, mostly on the upper lip, not below the red part of the lower lip. Uh, but you don't think about embouchure. Yeah. I hardly ever say anything about embouchure to a kid because if you get them started out right, you don't have any problem. Yeah. If they use the air. And if you don't use the air, you'll use the lip too much. But all the, through the years, horn players have you get up in the morning, well, I wonder if my is going to work today. This is a typical wonder, wondering question of horn players. I wonder if my lip's going to work. It's not your lip, it's your air and your ear. So forget about that, and you solve most of your problems. Right. Okay. Don't overthink things is yeah, a lot of what right. you're saying. 
you know, and, and hear the music and, and your body will respond to it. Well, what, um, what are some of the things that, um, keeps you on your edge or keep your passion flowing? <clears throat> Well, in the first place, I do enjoy working with young students. They kind of help to keep you young. And uh, the students that come to me, for the most part, want to learn. Otherwise, they don't come. So they're fun to work with. And it's a joy to see the progress that a student can make from week to week. Right. And... Uh, most of the time I don't have any problem that I have to change about the embouchure or anything. Just encourage them to learn how to use the air and the ear and think the pitch. And most of them are very musical kids. They've got a good ear, they can hear the pitch, and they're very receptive. They're eager to learn. And to me that's exciting. It's exciting to see the progress they make from one week to the next. Yeah. Well, in, in our last minute or two, um, is there um, a story that you would like to share that maybe um, you would like to maybe just demonstrate some kind of satisfaction in choosing your life as a music teacher or um, some kind of silly story that you, you, you picked up from one of your students? I'm sure there are lots of things at the moment I can't think of a prize one, but... Well, I can think of one. You, you know, you were talking about your student who... Uh, the difference between listening and hearing. Oh, that is a good one. This was when I was teaching in Norman. I had a seventh grade boy, a, dr a drummer. He studied with Alan Abel, who taught all my percussion players. Alan Abel was... He's just, the last few years, retired from the Philadelphia Orchestra after about 40 years with him. <laughs> Wonderful teacher. I studied with him myself. He taught all my percussion players. I had no idea what they were doing back there. So I thought, I'd better study with him and find out what's going on. So I studied with him. He was a wonderful teacher. I had no idea about getting a tone on a snare drum. I didn't think much about it. But you don't just pound. You get a tone out of it. Yeah. He taught me how. So, uh, uh, this young man, he uh, he was a student of Alan Abel, and and I was trying to tell them the difference between listening and hearing. This was a junior high class in Norman, and I was trying to get them to listen, and not just to hear. And the more I thought about it, boy, there's a big difference between hearing and listening. So I was explaining that to the students. And I said, cows can hear, but they don't listen. And he spoke up just immediately and said, you're right. I haven't seen any cows at any concerts lately. <laughs> and I never forgot that. Those are the things you remember. Yeah. The little prize jewels that happen in your teaching career where you're worried about everything under the sun and then along comes a jewel like that yeah. and you never forget it. Yeah, so don't sweat the little things. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Robinson. Um, and just, you know, for the people that are listening to this interview, um, I'm probably going to do another interview with Mr. Robinson um, because uh, he is one of the founders of the International Horn Society. And so um, I'm going to sit with him at some point and we're going to talk specifically about your career as a college professor at FSU and at Baylor and, and how the whole organization of the Horn Society came about. Because but um, thank you for sharing your experience with us today. Well, thank you. Okay. Have a, have a good day.